This is a specialised Roubaix expert, my 2020 long-term bike. Spoiler alert, this is one of my favourite bikes of all time. I'm going to tell you why. First of all though, a big loud shout out to our kit sponsors Freewheel who hooked me up with everything I'm wearing right now. Check out the link in the description below. At this very moment however, it's a little bit chilly so I'm going to wear a coat for the rest of the video. For years now, the Roubaix has been a specialised endurance road bike. It's the squishy, comfortable, more upright alternative to the purely race focused tarmac. The USP of this incarnation of the Roubaix is the Future Shock suspension cartridge at the headset. The Roubaix Expert gets Future Shock 2.0, which features an adjustable damper, and it's the most affordable model in the range that gets that. Models below this get the Future Shock 1.5, which you can change springs on, but which has no on the fly adjustment. This bike with Altegra Di2 costs. £5,400 in the UK and I should note this is a 2020 model it's entirely possible there'll be changes for 2021 but we're expecting it to continue more or less as is. The Roubaix Expert gets specialised second tier frame set. The very top spec as with all specialised bikes is the S-Works which is made from what they call FACT 11R carbon. This model is FACT 10R Specialises a little bit vague about the differences there. Supposedly it might be around 50 grams heavier, making for a frame weight of something in the region of 950 grams. But that's not gospel. Don't take it as being absolute fact. Everything about the Roubaix's frame set is built on the idea that smooth is fast. It's all about comfort and absorbing bumps. At the front end, you've got the Future Shock, which gives you 20 mil of travel, while at the back end, Specialized has built in loads of compliance. What they've done essentially is anchored the seat post quite a bit lower than it actually looks like. The seat clamp in reality is 65 mil below the top of the seat tube, and that means that there's a huge extent of seat post that's able to flex back and forth. It's also got a D-shaped cross section, which means it's naturally tending to flex backwards. I'll talk about this more at length, but there are lots of things about this bike that make it kind of gravel adjacent. It's not a gravel bike, it is a road bike, but there are many features that kind of overlap with the world of gravel. Tire clearance is one. This doesn't have huge clearances, but officially it will take up to a 33, and there's a good chance you'd be able to squeeze something even a little bit bigger in there. In terms of standards, there's nothing radical or surprising about this bike. It's 12 mil through axles, front and rear, flat mat brakes. However, it does have a threaded bottom bracket, which will make you very happy if you like to maintain your own bikes because it's just easier to work on. A return to threaded bottom brackets has been a bit of a theme of 2021 with other notable bikes such as the new Trek Imonda featuring them. The Roubaix's geometry is pure endurance. This is a size 54 bike and it's got 376 mil of reach, which is on the shorter end, and 585 mil of stack, which is quite tall. And there's some extra stack by virtue of the fact that these are actually riser drop bars, not something you get on many bikes. Despite the endurance focus, the wheelbase is actually relatively short at 988 millimeters for this size. Incidentally, like all of Specialized road range, this is a unisex bike. No differentiation between male and female. Let me talk you through the Specialized Roubaix Experts build. Now, I've changed a few things and I'll say where I've done so, but the fundamentals are as standard. This bike has a full Shimano Altegra Di2 group set except that the rear derailleur is the RX version, which means it's got a clutch to keep the chain in check. Uh, that's the derailleur which has now kind of morphed into GRX, but remember this is a 2020 bike, so that didn't exist when this came out. The wheels are Roval C38 carbon clinchers. They've got an internal width of 21 mil, plays nice with big tires, and they're built on hubs with DT Swiss internals, so you've got 
good reputation for reliability there. Specialized normally fits its own 28mm tubeless tyres to this bike, but I'm currently running Schwalbert Pro 1 TLE tubeless tyres, which I'll talk about in a bit. All the stock finishing kit is specialized zone stuff. I've still got the standard bar and seat post here, but the stock 100 mil stem was too short for me, so I'm currently running a random Sintase, which is 110, which doesn't really blend that well with the cockpit and steerer and the spacers, but it works and I don't really care. The bike normally comes with a specialized power saddle, which I know a lot of you love. That's the really stubby one that a huge number of people have on their road bikes now. I don't quite get on with it and I've been experimenting with a few different saddles. Currently it's got an older Selle Italia Novus Boost but I'm probably going to change that next week anyway so it's not forever. A couple more personal choices are these bottle cages which you may remember from a previous long-term bike, the Trekimonda ALR. These are Arendelle stainless steel cages, in my opinion, some of the prettiest cages on the market. And I quite like the slight irony of putting heavy steel bottle cages on a very lightweight carbon bike. I've also got what are arguably very appropriate pedals on this bike, Speedplay Zero Paves, which are the special edition version of the Zero, which has the plastic body all stripped away, which means that they shed mud better, much better than the standard pedal. These were a pro-only option when they first appeared. You used to spot them at Roubaix on the bikes of a select few, but then Speedplay eventually made them available to the public and they've been out for a few years now. Finally, I've got my trusty Garmin Edge 530 on its very reliable out front mount. Claimed weight for this bike is 7.9 kilos. I've chopped and changed loads of components. When I first weighed it with heavier tyres, different saddle, it was at 8.6 kilos, including pedals and cages. I reckon it's probably somewhere around 8.4, 8.5 as you see it here, but it's in that general ballpark. Now, let me tell you why I love this bike so much. Basically, it's just a complete delight to ride. I was a little bit skeptical about the whole future shot concept because suspension on road bikes frankly feels like a bit of an indulgence. You don't actually need fancy squishy technology because with good design and the right tyres there should be enough squish on offer. The thing about the Future Shock is it just works extremely well. It kind of gets on with doing its thing and a lot of the time you sort of forget it's there. When you're riding along on a road with a cracked surface or little bumps on it and you look down you can see the shock cover moving. So it's doing its thing all the time, but there seems to be so little stiction in the shock that it's very active, even if they are really tiny bumps. And I think that's why it works so effectively. I've also found that you can brake really hard, for example, on a fast descent. And while there is a little bit of shock dive, you don't really feel it and there isn't like a hard bottoming out effect. So I'm very happy to leave it in its fully open position. Obviously a big selling point of the Future Shock 2.0 is that you can adjust it, but I've found that in practice I don't really want to. That's partly because I'm quite forgetful and if I do close the knob down, I tend to forget and then when I hit a bumpy section I'm like, why does this feel wrong? But it also just doesn't seem that important to lock it out. It does sharpen the front end up, but most of the time I don't feel the need. The one time you really notice the Future Shock moving is if you're cranking quite hard from side to side, for example, up a really steep climb. And in that situation, you get a bit of front end bob. But again, it's more something that you get used to. It doesn't actually detract massively from the ride. Unfortunately, one of the first things I did to the Future Shock on this bike was I broke it. Basically, I was getting set up to go on a trip and I was fiddling with it not totally sure how it fit together, turned it too hard and I snapped the adjuster off and damaged the seat of the circlip that holds the whole thing together. Q a very grovelling email to Specialized, they took the bike back, fixed it and it was fine again. But this does show that you do have to be a little bit gentle. When you hit the end of the travel of the adjuster knob, you should stop, take it from me. 
My first proper experience with the Roubaix was driving to Italy and riding it in Tuscany on the famous Strada Bianchi roads around the route of the Eroica vintage race. For this trip, I fitted 32mm Continental GP5000 tubeless tyres, which remain my favourite all-round choice for this bike, because they're big, squishy, comfortable, but on tarmac they feel as fast as any other road tyre. I was able to run those down at about 45-50ish psi, and on the relatively smooth but varying gravel of Tuscany, they were an absolute delight, just so, so good. I did find their limits at one point, however, which is on that very, very fine gravel that acts almost like a lubricant. They really don't have that much traction, and I managed to fall over on a very slow climb and scratch myself up, which was stupid, but pretty much entirely my own fault. Back in the UK, a lot of the riding that I've done on this bike has been what you might call gravel adjacent. I live on the edge of the Forest of Dean and a lot of my rides take me on tarmac but then I'll dip off onto a fire road or a little bit of single track even. This is where this bike, in my opinion, really shines. As I've said before, it's very much a road bike but in that kind of mixed surface scenario, it is so good because it's got all the speed of a road bike but the squishy front end and the surprisingly compliant rear end as well, which I think is really well balanced, just makes it astonishingly comfortable in scenarios where a normal road bike would flounder a little bit. Obviously, riding off tarmac places a stronger emphasis on tyre selection. Right now, I've got those 28mm Schwalbe Pro 1 tyres on, which are really a pure road race type tyre and you'd think totally unsuitable for mixed surface riding. But because I can run them tubeless at very low pressures, and because I've got this very comfy frame set, they actually work surprisingly well. But then overall, I still think the 32mm Contis were the golden ticket for this bike. I really do think that this is better than any endurance bike that doesn't have fancy squishy technology. I think the Roval C38 wheels that Specialized suspect here are a really good choice as well because they do work really well with wider tyres and they're just they're a very useful all-round depth. They do catch a bit more wind than some other rim sections but really they're not bad at all. I've had absolutely no issue with them and they are respectively light for the sort of wheels they are. It's obviously been quite a weird year for cycling but the Roubaix has been my faithful companion through all of it. For example, I did a huge number of pre-work rides in that period of lockdown where you were only allowed out of the house once a day and I couldn't have been happier doing it on this bike. Another highlight for me was my one and only multimodal ride, which is something I was hoping to do more of before public transport became problematic. That's where you ride out somewhere and get a train home. That means that you can do a fun A to B ride rather than having to do a loop that ends back at home. I've always loved mechanical group sets, but spending a long time with Altegra Di2 has really reminded me just how good a group set this is. It is so, so consistently reliable. I've also come to quite like the semi-synchronized shifting mode, which is the one where you take care of shifting both front and rear, but when you shift your front derailleur, it compensates at the back by shifting a couple of gears, and it's just quite nice. It just means less fiddling with the shifters. The one downside to DI2 is that you do have to remember to charge it. DI2 is powered by one central battery that lasts a really, really long time, and because you have to charge it so infrequently, it's quite easy to forget, which is exactly what I did. Very, very stupid and so I was a good 20 kilometres from home one day and found myself in my little ring and because DI2 doesn't let you cross chain either that means that I was in a very very low gear for the whole rest of the ride home. The gearing instantly is really nice and wide and works well across all sorts of riding. Fronts are 50, 34 compact and rear is an 11 to 34 cassette so your low gear is a 3434, which will get you up pretty much anything. That's handy, especially if you're running slightly larger tires. I should probably mention some negative points, and there are very minor ones. 
to be my perfect bike for life, this would really have to have mudguard mounts. That's fenders for you North American viewers. If you buy a Specialized Diverge, you do get the mounts, but this doesn't have them, which I think is a little bit of a shame because a set of hidden mounts would cost nothing, but would add real versatility for year-round riding in rainy climates like the UK. Also, the cabling at the front end is a bit of a spaghetti mess. A lot of new high-end bikes have gone to integrated cabling, which can be a bit of a nightmare from a mechanics point of view, but looks super, super clean. And if you're running a trendy bar bag, which I like to do sometimes, it makes it easier because in this configuration, the cables do sometimes get in the way a little bit. It doesn't really matter. It's just not as neat as it could be, but I'd be really surprised if the next generation Roubaix doesn't go with more internal cabling. Obviously also at 5,400 pounds in the UK, this isn't a cheap bike, but I actually think it's worth it. And that surprises me. So, the Specialized Roubaix Expert is one of my favorite all-time bikes because it is so good at so many things, whether that's fast hairpin descents and gravel in Tuscany or rattling around the Forest of Dean day to day. It's so much fun to ride and it's really made me think hard about what I appreciate in a bike in a way that not many bikes have. I'm really looking forward to seeing where Specialized takes the concept next. I could imagine, for example, that you could have an electronically switchable damper, which would be amazing if you could just flick a switch on the bar and have the shot come on and off. That way you wouldn't have to be fiddling with a knob while you're riding, which is always risky. I'm going to be really sad when I send this bike back to Specialized because it is just so good in so many ways. It rides great, it looks great, I think. It's got lovely sparkly metallic paint. Also, really importantly, it's convinced me that there is a place for suspension on road bikes, which was something I was quite skeptical about before. Do you think I'm wrong about that? I'd really love to know your thoughts. Do you think suspension should be kept away from road bikes because it's unnecessary complexity? Do you think electronic shifting is a gross indulgence of capitalist pigs? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and please hit that little bell icon so you get notified about all our new videos.